In the last two videos, we learned a couple techniques for line and wash. Now let's take those into the field. Keep it simple to start. Take a sketchbook that has paper that you know works well with this technique, so try it out ahead of time. This one has what's called stone paper, which has a nice slick surface and allows the ink to move. And I have a pen that has water-soluble ink. And then this is what is called a water brush. It has water in the brush handle. And when it gets low, you can just unscrew the brush portion and refill it by squeezing and then sticking the end in some water and letting go and it will drink up some more water. And you can refill it that way. And then I like to take a cloth with me. This is a microfiber cloth which you can see has been on some painting expeditions and it'll absorb enough to last me pretty much all day sketching and that way I don't have to carry a whole lot of paper towels or use up a lot of paper towels. An alternative to a sketchbook is to just cut up some pieces of watercolor paper and put them in a little Ziploc bag. So to recap, if you're going out to sketch with the method of water-soluble line, you'll need a sketchbook or some small pieces of watercolor paper, a water-soluble pen, a water brush, or you can just take a regular brush and a small water container, and some sort of small cloth for blotting or wiping clean your brush. And that's really all you need. So very light and portable. If you're going to work in color, um, you can get a little travel palette. Like this one is the Whiskey Painter palette. It's one of the um, less expensive ones, but it's still very nicely made. And I like to fill mine with tube colors. Um, you can buy these little half pans empty and fill them yourself, or you can buy them already full of paint. And you can buy sets that already have paint in them. And now I have this fancy little cup which I thought would be fabulous and it collapses all the time so what I actually wind up doing is using the lid which works really well. And um, I like it because it's a little heavier, doesn't blow around, but there are lots of other options. For example, the plastic condiment cup or a little plastic Dixie cup or uh, another nice possibility is this uh, Nalgene bottle and when I take this one I just use the cap as my water container to rinse my brush. To take your brushes to the field the best option is probably one of these um, small brush holders like this or you can buy these travel brushes where the brush is inside the handle um, some of these are super expensive because they're sable, um, Kalinsky sable, but there are some very nice synthetic ones, so shop around. You should be able to find something in the $10 range, maybe, for a travel brush. And then you'll need some kind of water container. I like to use this hip flask because it fits nicely in the pouch that I have and also because it's funny. And then I wrap some masking tape around it so I don't have to carry a separate roll of masking tape. And then if you're going to work on little pieces of watercolor paper or postcards, something to tape down your paper on, like a little piece of plexiglass, or a piece of cardboard covered with packing tape works just fine too. So just to reiterate, if you're going to actually do waterproof line and watercolor, you'll need a sketchbook or some small pieces of watercolor paper, a waterproof pen, your travel watercolor set, and there are a lot of do-it-yourself options, so try looking on YouTube. Um, water brush or some regular paint brushes in a carrier and a small water container. Um, a small cloth for blotting your brush. A painting support, so anything light and flexible. And I forgot to mention masking tape in this list, but you do probably want to also bring masking tape if you're bringing small separate pieces of paper. Uh, tip number two is to keep it simple as far as your sketching subject, too. So um, one thing you can do if you're traveling with other people is sketch the things on your dinner table while you're waiting for your meal to arrive in a restaurant. 
and that way you get some time to sketch and they don't get bored. It's not the um, glamorous thing that you thought you were going to sketch when you travel, but it's keeping your pen moving, it's keeping you in practice. So if you do lots of these little sketches, your sketches of the big important scenes will be much better too. So fill those sketchbooks, just keep sketching. Whenever there's a moment where you're not moving, even on a moving bus, I have done sketches, and they're pretty awful, but you're training your eye. Tip number three, focus on one interesting detail. This is the front facade of the Lensic Theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I had about 10 minutes on the square there on the plaza to do some sketching, so there was no way that I was going to do this whole theater facade. But instead, I picked one window, and I stuck to black and white just using my water-soluble line and water. And I was able to capture something of the character of this building with this one window. Tip number four, skip the background. These are some California poppies and they were in a field of all kinds of other flowers and grasses and adding all that detail in the background would just really add confusion and not showcase the beautiful shapes of these flowers. Tip number five, think to yourself silhouette and shadows. Most of our ability to determine what an object is has to do with looking at the outer silhouette of it and where the shadows fall. So if you keep telling yourself to focus on silhouette and shadows, you can get a suggestion of the scene down with a minimal amount of actual drawing. Tip number six, plan to draw from memory. Here's a little sketchbook page from a travel journal where I have drawn our map of our route as we drove from Minnesota out through Nebraska. And along the drive, I had set out with the idea that I was going to try to remember some of the scenery and sketch it in our hotel room that night because, of course, I couldn't draw while I was driving. Trying to um, draw from memory is difficult. Because I planned this ahead of time, I was on the lookout for things like the shape of this little hill and this little barn here that stuck in my mind, and they probably got combined into scenes that weren't actual scenes that we saw, but are representative of the kind of landscape. Tip number seven, be brave and draw people. Um, a lot of times you'll feel self-conscious about drawing people and it can make people uncomfortable if you're staring at them. So I have a lot of drawings in my sketchbook of the backs of people's heads on trains, buses, airplanes, coffee shops. But also consider drawing people who are performing because performers expect you to be looking at them. Um, they're up there intending to be looked at, and they usually are not at all put off by it. A lot of times they won't know it, notice, and if they do notice, they're often flattered that you're taking the time to sketch them. And even though this sketch doesn't really look like the guy that I was sketching, and his hat is big enough for three guys, um, he was walking up and down the aisles, and he saw what I was doing, and he was actually quite pleased and flattered that I took the time to sketch him. So don't feel bad if the drawing doesn't really look like the person. People are flattered that you took the time to pay that kind of attention to them, even if the drawing isn't all that great. And 99 times out of 100, they'll think the drawing is fabulous, even if you think it's awful. Tip number eight, use foreground framing. Here's another example. This is the Cathedral of St. Francis in Santa Fe, and it's from the porch, not actually of the Museum of Indian Arts. That's wrong. It's the Palace of the Governors. But the point is, that's a fairly complicated building back there, and instead of trying to draw everything, I wanted to focus just on this little portion, and so I used the column here and the front of the porch as framing to kind of block out and isolate the part that I was interested in. Then in the rose window, each of those little pieces is actually just a brush mark, 
and I've done a little line work to kind of intensify the shadowing on some of them. And the rest of the, quote, detail is just little dots and lines, a little suggestion of the brick or the stone. And otherwise, I've just, again, said to myself, silhouette and shadow, big shapes, the main outline, because that's all I had time for. And still, this gives me... Uh, a sense of what it's like to be on that square under the porch looking across at the cathedral. So now that you've looked at some examples, let's do a couple sketches and put this into practice. This is the um, Sand Island Light in the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. And um, there's a lot to draw here. There's this house, or the lighthouse building with the various complicated shapes that it has. Architecture is always a challenge. The lighthouse perspective is a bit of a challenge, so if you only have a few minutes, you might not be able to draw everything. So I'm just going to sketch this really quickly as if I don't have a lot of time and maybe about the size I would put on a postcard. And already you will notice that I have made some mistakes in drawing. And I want to talk about the issue of mistakes because a lot of times people think that if they can't put the line down correctly in the first attempt and they have to go back and restate it or, or erase if you're working in pencil, that that means that they don't have talent and they can't be an artist. When you make a mistake in drawing, what's really happening is you're recording a little window into how your visual system really works. As you get more experienced and you have more practice, you'll start to catch those things a little quicker. But that's a matter of practice and knowing some tricks of the trade helps too. And there are a lot of good books out there on how to draw. So I'm not going to address that in this video. But I do want to encourage you when you are drawing to be kind to yourself when you make mistakes because a lot of that is a result of the fact that your visual system was designed to help you navigate in the world, not to draw three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional two piece of paper. So your brain is already moving things around and rotating things mentally, and that's a good thing because that's how you can recognize the same building from a slightly different angle and still see it as the same building. But it's a little bit of a nuisance if you're trying to draw. And that just means that you're probably going to put lines down and then recognize that, oh, that's not quite right, and go back and correct them. And you're always going to be making an approximation of the scene, and the approximations will just get a little bit better as you go along. But it can be frustrating because what's on the page is always the thing you put down before you realized, oh wait, that's a little different. So the drawing, I say the drawing always runs behind your understanding. So the drawing always seems to be not very good to you, even though it's improving. So recognize that and don't beat yourself up. Just know that that's normal for everybody. It's how our brains work. And as you practice, you'll start to catch those things quicker and earlier in the drawing and make fewer, quote, mistakes. Okay, so let's do a little bit of pulling out some of this color. I'm looking for where the shadows are so that I can give this a little suggestion of form. This color isn't moving very well for me, so I may have to go back and put in a little more ink, but I'm starting to get a little suggestion of form. I've got a shadow over here, so let's put this side of the building in shadow. Already it looks better with just a little bit. And this side is shadowed, and there's a little shadow underneath the eaves here. So maybe we'll go back and, and add a little ink here so we can darken those lines up. And since I'm just trying to darken it, I'm not going to worry about the fact that the ink is bleeding. I just want a little more ink to work with to shadow things. And I've been drawing now for about uh, four minutes since we started on this. So you can see this is a very quick little sketch. If you had a half an hour to sit at this scene, you'd probably be able to get much more accurate than I have.
But still, that would be fine if I then wrote some commentary underneath and sent it off in a postcard. I'm going to give just a little suggestion of the stone, of the bricks. Uh, you don't need to do this everywhere. If you do a little bit of it, people will understand that that represents that the building is made from stone. So here's a bonus tip. After you try a sketch, try the same sketch again in some different way. So this time, let's try the waterproof line. This is the platinum carbon pen, and the ink is waterproof, but this paper has a lot of sizing, so the ink sits on the surface, and if I get it wet right away, it moves just because it hasn't dried yet. So I have to make sure that my lines are dry before I put any watercolor on. So let's just sketch this again super fast with the help of a little video magic. And then we'll just suggest the outside silhouette of the building and we'll call it good. Now let's go in and add a little color. So remember with line and wash we want to think kind of a splash of color. So instead of trying to paint this whole background, I'm just going to kind of wiggle my brush around back here and give a suggestion that it's a blue sky day so the viewer knows now what kind of day it is I don't have to paint the whole sky now I've mixed up a dark gray using ultramarine blue and burnt sienna you can also use cobalt blue and burnt umber and I'm going to use that to just suggest this dark here in the roof that's pretty wet. And notice that um, that dark goes actually right on behind. You can see it through the glass. So I'm going to bring that right on down. But I'm leaving little whites and that sort of suggests the sunlight glinting off of things and gives the scene a little bit more life. So I'm not coloring it in like a coloring book letting the lines do the work of suggesting the form and I'm just splashing on some of the color. So here I've skipped almost to the end of this sketch because this video is really just um, to introduce the various tips for sketching in the field. In the next video we're going to take a single scene and what we've learned in this video and the last two and develop the sketch from start to finish showing the individual steps.